Hi guys, uh, this video is a response to a request that was put onto uh, one of my videos, one of my other videos, and it's in relation specifically to the Piper Cherokee uh, from A to A simulations and how to land the thing. And I suppose the key here is that uh, one of the critical things that real life pilots do is they spend uh, hour after hour practicing landings. After all, it's a bit that's most likely to hurt you. And one of the key elements here is that A2A simulations have done a very accurate rendition of the aerodynamics. And so whereas with most uh, FSX aircraft you can pretty much just plant it onto the ground, this thing does require some finesse to, uh, to, to carry out good landings. Now, what I'm going to quickly do is talk about the aerodynamics for a couple of minutes and then we'll have a look at some of the flying techniques that are available to us. So what do I mean by aerodynamics? Well. The Piper Cherokee is a low wing monoplane as you can see here, uh, it's got a certain amount of dihedral. Uh, the dihedral doesn't really affect us too much but there's uh, two key things that affect us. The first thing is the wing itself. By virtue of being low wing, uh, why is that an issue? It's because of a thing called ground effect or ground cushioning. Now in normal flight the airflow comes forwards, it hits the leading edge or in fact it doesn't, there's a stagnation point just in front of it where the air then splits. One uh, stream goes above, a stream goes below. Now the common uh, misconception is that the two airflows uh, take the same amount of time to get to the back, to the trailing edge of the wing and then continue on their merry way and because this surface is, is a longer distance the air has to speed up to meet its counterpart here. Now NASA have done some airflow tests which basically say they don't meet up but nonetheless the fact of the matter is that this airflow is faster than this airflow so you get your low pressure here, your high pressure here, lifts the aircraft. What's not immediately apparent uh, but it's in quite a lot of the commercial um, theory textbooks is that after the wing you get a downwash, a downflow of air. So the air comes in at this level but it actually leaves the wing somewhere down here. What significance is that? Well, if you're, if you're in free air somewhere up here, not a problem. As you get close to the ground though, you can't get the same level of downwash. So what happens is you end up with a, a, a slightly higher buildup of pressure underneath the wing. Um, and what you end up with is a situation, because this downwash is different, you end up with a slightly different uh, effective angle of attack. Uh, it's all very big words, but basically the short of it is you have an in a slight increase in the pressure beneath the wing compared to that above the wing, and that means that as you get into ground effect, you generate more lift. Now, the height of the ground effect is generally considered to be half of the wingspan. So if you imagine a line down the centre of the aircraft, this distance here is the same as the height of the uh, ground effect or the ground cushion. Now obviously it's not consistent, it's stronger as you get towards the ground and weaker as you get up here. It doesn't just suddenly take effect all of a sudden. Um, but that has two real principal things. The first thing is that you get this gradual increase in lift, which means the aircraft is, has a, a lower tendency or is less willing, shall we say, to get to the ground. Now. In theory, you'd think, oh, well, you know, surely free lift or easy lift is, is a beneficial thing. It's not if you're trying to do a short landing. When you're doing short landings, you want this thing to get to the ground as early as possible so you can start braking. Uh, the second thing is, this, uh, this ground cushion can cause uh, problems. There are instances where an aircraft uh, rotates too early and it gets four, five, six feet in the air because it's still under the ground cushion. But as it moves upwards, the amount of lift uh, aid from the ground cushion reduces, but it hasn't got enough forward airspeed outside of the ground effect to, uh, to maintain the height. So what then happens is you get an aircraft that wallows a few feet above the ground, can't accelerate adequately to generate its airspeed needed, um, but the lift boost underneath means that it's airborne, but it's not climbing because it can't get out of the ground effect. Um, quite often that results in aircraft going through the uh, the fence of the hedge at the far end of the runway um, as they wallow their way into the uh, into the bushes. So that's the first thing is to be aware of ground effect. The closer to the ground you get the more lift benefit you get from ground effect and in effect it will cause the aircraft to want to float. So that will extend your landing distance so you have to be aware of that. What can you do to counter that? You can fly the right speed. 
um, you can fly the right approach speed. If you come in with too much speed, the ground effect is greater for the more speed you have, and you'll have to bleed off speed, and that takes time. This is Birmingham Airport in the UK. You can see the length of the runway for a PA28, that's really not an issue. Um, but for a jumbo, or well, not a jumbo, the 777 that flies in here, that's a huge issue. The next thing to be aware of is the propeller. Now, if I sit here, let me just drop it down a bit with a view, you can see that the propeller disc, any airflow getting thrown back from that, will hit the fin uh, and the rudder and the stabilator, but not the ailerons. What that means is that uh, this portion here, the leading edge uh, and the wing root, are within the disc of air that's being thrown backwards by the propeller. Now that air is moving faster than the air that the plane's moving through, so you have an area of increased lift here. That means that if you increase your power, open your throttle, all of a sudden you have an increase in airflow going over this section of the wing, and, oh, hello, here we go, 146 is going to uh, crash into us, hopefully it's going to miss us. Oh, it's doing a go-around. Well done, FSX. Um, this portion of the wing will generate more lift if you increase the throttle and therefore the aircraft will rise. If you remove the power from the engine, you throttle back, this will generate less lift and you will go down. And that's an almost instantaneous effect. The piston engines are very responsive in an aircraft like this uh, and therefore the airflow that comes off the back of them is uh, very changeable. It's an almost immediate effect. And so the lift portions here, uh, which benefit you, will uh, reduce or increase dependent. Likewise, these controls here, the rudder and stabilator, are in the airflow from the propeller. So if you have a high power setting with lots of air being thrown back, these become quite taut and responsive. If you have a low power setting, they become quite wallowy and uh, inaccurate. And then likewise, at low air speeds, the ailerons uh, become less effective because the airflow going over them is reduced. So now we've got two things to think about. Low wing monoplane, makes this harder to land with regards to ground effect and ground cushioning than say a Cessna 172182 which is a high wing monoplane. Um, the second thing is you've got to be wary of the propeller and the airflow of the propeller. The third thing to remember now is in terms of the undercarriage. Now we want uh, a nose up landing profile for two reasons. First off um, our speed should be such that in order to maintain uh, a relatively reasonable rate of descent the nose wheel is off the ground. These things are very robust, the main wheels, they're designed to take most of the aircraft weight and all of the aircraft impact hitting the runway. These things are not the nose wheels. There's no end of crashes uh, in the general aviation documentation where these things collapse, either because the pilot lands with these things first, or it's dropped onto the ground, or it's a rough landing where um, the nose wheel has too much weight on it. Now the nose wheel is for low speed to stop the prop hitting the ground and help you steer. Uh, at high speed, you need to try and relieve a lot of the weight off this. So in effect, you fly the nose wheel by using your stabilator. So there we go, we've got three key things to think about. One is the low wing with the ground cushion, one is the propeller with its effects on controls and lift, and the final one is the nose wheel. So, how do we control the aircraft in terms of landing? Um, normally, flying the aircraft, you would use pitch to affect your flight path and the engine to affect your speed. However, when you approach, um, unlike a big jet, these things don't have huge amounts of inertia, but they do have an incredibly responsive engine. So what you actually do in landing is you use the engine to control your altitude, or your rate of descent, I should say, and you use your pitch of the uh, aircraft to control your speed. The reason being is that the control of speed is less responsive, but the engine is more responsive. So really with this it's a bizarre combination with a jet it's different you just drive it at the ground and then your engines which are less responsive in a jet are used to control speed the reason being is that the inertia of the plane means it's not really that um, that picky about speed it doesn't increase or decrease speed uh, at the same rate as one of these will one of these is quite draggy but the engine is quite responsive however you use your engine to control your rate of descent because you change your power setting, you then change your pitch to maintain that speed. And landing one of these is all about speed. So what we'll do now is we'll get into the air and I'll demonstrate what we're looking at. Okay guys, you join me now um, as I come back round towards Birmingham. Um, now I'm about 2,000 feet, just over 2,100 feet above the airfield. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to line us up on finals and then I'm going to talk through uh, an approach as we come round. So I just need to tighten that turn. We're at 110 knots and we're, uh, we're pretty much level, uh, give or take a slight descent because of the turn. Let's get ourselves round. This is all visual of course, slightly right of centre line but I can correct that as we come down. Now we're, uh, we're going to fly initially level and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the key elements on how to fly this approach. We are um, just slightly above a three degree glide slope so we'll start a descent and then I'll uh, quickly pause it and uh, give you a quick update as to what's going on. Right, our touchdown point is over here. You can see the white approach lights, our touchdown point is uh, just generally beyond those and on the left you've got the four white lights of the puppies. Now the puppies, the precision approach path indicators, are only generally at uh, medium to large airfields. Uh, they have four lights, two white, two red, and we indicate a three degree glide slope. Now the first thing I'm going to point out here is that a three degree glide slope is great for an airliner but it's not necessarily great for a single engine lightweight aircraft like this because the problem is if you lose the engine you become a very very posh expensive brick and generally you will fall short of the airfield somewhere down here so because you're at low speed you generally have a flaps out uh, you haven't got much momentum because you're a light aircraft um, and as a result as soon as you remove this prop remember we had the issue with the prop slipstream going over our wing roots so as soon as you lose this, you lose your thrust, you lose a small portion of your lift, you lose your inertia and momentum very quickly, and to maintain airspeed you have to whack the nose down significantly. That means that if you've already deployed flap, you'll uh, end up meeting the fields just short of the airfield. So you'll quite often find that a light aircraft will fly a steeper approach than 3 degrees. It's nice to fly the airliner style approach at 3 degrees, but in one of these it's not essential. Because you've got a couple of things to help you out here. Uh, you've got some flaps that actually can help you with a significant rate of descent. Uh, you've also got uh, a trick called side slipping, which I shall uh, show you in this section. Uh, what I'm also going to do, by the way, is I'll, uh, I'll do this approach and landing, and then I will demonstrate a couple, a much smaller airfield. One how to do it incorrectly, and one how to do more of a short field landing. And they will have fewer references than this does. So that's the key thing there. Um, and... We've discussed the wing route, the side slip, and the flaps, really. And between those three things, uh, that's what we're going to use to help us control our descent if we have to. Now, in terms of controlling rate of descent, I'm going to use it, uh, use the throttle to control the rate of descent and the pitch, the, uh, the elevators, or the stabilator in this case, to control the speed. We're quite high at the moment. We're at 117-odd knots. The approach speed for this aircraft, uh, we're going to establish in a moment, is 85 knots. Um, and then our actual landing speed with full flaps is between 65 and 75. So we'll aim for 85 knots and then 70 knots. Um, and that's the two speeds which I'm looking at as key speeds. So without further ado, let's get on with it. Okay, let's bring the throttle back because we want to slow down. Uh, let's get ourselves onto the centre line nicely. Um, I've got no idea what the wind is with this, so you shall have to bear with me. The speed's starting to come back. Now my key here is not to fly the glide slope. You can see how wallowy it's becoming with the ailerons. Not to fly the glide slope or the approach until I've got the speed right. Um, because ultimately, once you've got the speed right, it's much easier then to, uh, to fly your approach. So just bring a little bit of the power back on so that we're not going to uh, foul the plugs too much in terms of uh, the carbs. Now you can see we've got three whites and a red, so it means we're slightly high. Um, we are slightly high on the glide slope, but as I say, for a light aircraft, that's not generally a problem. Now, we're going to start with uh, some flap. The speed's slightly high, so we're going to need some extra drag here. So let's stick two stages of flap out. You do get a change of pitch, and you do get a change in rate of descent. You'll notice our rate of descent uh, for a significant period there actually... Uh, actually decreased quite markedly. So let me show you what I mean in terms of uh, the controls. So uh, we're just about at 85 knots. If I want to go down, which I do in this case, I take the, th the throttle off, I reduce power. My speed's going to go down so I pitch down to maintain the right speed. 
and what happens is our rate of descent will increase and you can see it down here it's coming up to six seven hundred feet a minute rate of descent okay now our actual landing techniques what we're going to do is we have our frame of reference which is the horizon in the canopy you can see we're now down to three reds uh, three whites one red our touchdown point here what we want to do is keep that as long as we keep this frame of reference right we want to keep that in the screen if it moves up we're going to land short if it moves down we're going to land long so let's go to full flat now again you've got the pitch change um, we're still at 85 knots but what I've got is I've got a relatively low power setting and what you can see now is the runway is moving up in the windscreen so what that tells me is we are going to land short 85 miles an hour let's put some power on maintain our 85 knots and then watch what happens with the runway the runway is ever so slightly moving down in the windscreen okay so let's get rid of that that's in the way so that's our two methods of, uh, of uh, or sorry our two key things is that when the runway is moving up or down you counter it accordingly with uh, the throttle and then you use your pitch to adjust your speed so let's take a bit of power off and we'll maintain three degree glide slope We've got a lovely long runway, so what we're going to do is we're going to go up here. Okay, we're now very high. We can use full flap. Oh, but we've already got full flap. So how do we get down from here? We can side slip. So let's put full right rudder in and crab left with our ailerons look. And let's see what we can get as a rate of descent, because we've got quite a high position here relative to this runway. So as I say, full rudder using ailerons now to steer to the left and right if you look at the right our rate of descent now is rapidly getting towards a thousand feet a minute and this is the kind of technique that you would use if you have to come over um, some low uh, trees or something before the threshold so we're looking now to keep this point here approximately constant in the windscreen if it's in the same place it means we're going to hit it now it's going up so let's apply some power just take the rudder off and then what we can do now is get close to the ground, get the wings level, flare. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply quite a bit of back pressure. And we're looking to maintain a constant aspect. So if you, uh, if you excuse my rudder pedal steering, which is appalling. When you look at it, we had our, probably what, about an inch and a half um, between the horizon and our cowling. So... Uh, that's what we were using in order to uh, if you like establish our pitch so let's just go outside in effect this is our landing attitude and if you remember looking inside we had probably two and a half inches uh, between the horizon and this section of the cowling what we did is when we approached the airfield the runway down here with a view to landing you can see it's not taken as a great deal of distance to land from the numbers which are about there we then select our landing attitude and close the throttle. Now, the best description of when to do that is described as when it feels like the runway is coming up to meet your ears, uh, when it feels like the ground is coming up around your ears. And it's easier to say than to actually do. Oh, look at that, that's awful. Canted off really badly there. But fundamentally what you're looking at doing is wait till it comes up around your ears and then what you do is you set your landing attitude and close the throttle so you bring the throttle fully back um, and gradually you bring the cowling so it looks about an inch to an inch and a half below the uh, below the horizon so on my screen that's approximately two and a half inches because I've got quite a large screen that's probably two and a half inches um, what you want to do is bring the cowling so it's probably about this position and then just hold it so you've got the throttle closed, full flaps, and you just hold it and you wait. Now we landed with quite a thump. That is not a problem in a light aircraft. Yes, you can grease these things on, but the problem you then get is you get float. So if you close the throttle partially with the intent of greasing this thing on, um, what can happen then is you end up with a significant amount of float and this thing will continue flying and continue flying and continue flying and you eat up ground and I'll demonstrate that in a moment we're going to go to a very short airfield um, and that's the first element of it the second element is this undercarriage 
uh, is not very forgiving for landing. So if you get a bump, don't worry about it. The reason being is these are just vertical oleo shock absorbers. They're filled with oil and gas, generally nitrogen because it's inert. Um, but basically what happens is, unlike say trailing link undercarriage or the undercarriage you see on something like a 747 where it has multiple wheels on the bogies, these are very agricultural but they're very strong. So you'll generally find in real life a lot of the time you'll get a, a relatively significant thump when these things hit the ground. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go off to Bourne, um, which is a small uh, regional, well not even regional, it's a small local grass strip, and I shall see you there in a moment. Hi guys, welcome to Bourne. Uh, you can see, I mean this is down near Cambridge, so it's in the Cambridge of Fens, it's a lovely flat area part of the world, lovely part of the world. This is our runway, this is runway 36, it's only 550 to 600 metres long, it's much shorter than Birmingham. Um, you know, Birmingham's one and a half miles long, one and three quarter miles long. This is uh, just over a third of a mile long, much shorter. Couple of things now, it's quite short. And you can see from the position, we've got no landing aids around us here. So all we're now looking at is the shape and position of this uh, runway. And I can tell you looking at that, we are high. So we've started off high here. One of the main reasons is we've got this hedge line just short of the threshold. We haven't got the nice, uh, if you like, run up to the runway that we would have, the uh, the sort of over, or sorry, undershoot area we would have at, say, somewhere like Birmingham or JFK or wherever it is. So, I mean, the reason that's there is because the, uh, the undercarriage on something like a 747 or a 777 uh, is a long way below the pilot, but the tail also is. So um, when they come over the threshold, their aim is to be at 50 feet. Um, but they have this undershoot area where they uh, they try and keep it clear of obstructions. Not so with light aircraft airfields like this. So this is going to be a challenge to get in. Now the first approach I'm going to do, we're going to be going in pretty quick. Um, and we will see what happens in terms of... In fact, no, the first approach what we're going to do is we're going to try and do it uh, nice and slowly. Now our uh, approach speed previously was 85 and our landing speed was 65 to 75. Speed is critical in landing. I cannot emphasize that enough. If there's one thing you want to control more than anything else, it's this dial here, speed. This is pause, so I'm going to have to try and jump into it. I've got no idea what the trim settings are because I, uh, I saved this flight uh, yesterday. So I've got no idea if my controls are set up right with the trim. So what you'll see is this, uh, this manic bit uh, as I regain control of the aircraft. But this is critical. I'm going to want this down at 65 knots, full flaps, and uh, as we come over the hedge line, I'm going to let it bleed back to about 60. We are high, so speed control is going to be an issue. So I'm going to drop full flap immediately. Don't forget, we've got our frame of reference, which is this line on the horizon. And we're going to look at this, whether it comes towards us, which means we're overshooting, or away from us, which means we're undershooting. Um, and we're going to try and maintain that position in the windscreen, stationary so that we hit it. So let's see how we get on. There we go. There's the aircraft back again. Oh. Let's get full flap immediately. So, let's get the speed back. Get the speed back. There's 80. There's 70. Still retaining 70. Now looking at that position, it's remaining fairly static in the screen at 60, 65. Although we've got the throttle closed, we don't want the throttle closed. So let's side slip a bit and get ourselves a faster rate of descent to get down. I don't know what the wind is with this airfield at the moment, so still maintaining 65 knots using forward and back pressure on the stick, not using the engine for the speed, because the delay between the engine and the speed is too great. However, the engine and the speed are great for um, managing uh, the sort of rate of descent. So here we go, we're com coming back. Now you can see it's moving up the screen, that means in this configuration at 65 knots we're going to land short. That's not what we want, so we're going to straighten up to arrest our rate of descent from 1,000 feet a minute. We're going to apply power, and as a result of applying power, we can then uh, raise the nose to control our airspeed. So here we come. The aiming point, the numbers, are pretty stationary. The wind, by the way, is just off the right of the nose, so uh, that's why we're uh, crabbing slightly right. And we're aiming to be touching down between 65 and 60 was the numbers I gave you. 
So let's get ourselves nice and level. We're still at, well, we're at 67 to 68, and let's see what we can do. So up round our ears, slight flare, close the throttle, wheels are down, lower the nose wheel and brake. The wind's trying to, uh, to cant us off to the right with a, a weathercocking effect. And let's see exactly where we landed. Okay. So let's have a look outside. Get the flaps up, just clean the aircraft up. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five lines in front of us on the runway. We're on the sixth, and behind us we've only got one, two, three. So we've used, what, three instead of five, about 40% of the length of the runway. And it's only a 600 metre runway. <coughs> Excuse me. And we did that by maintaining the right speed. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset the situation and I'm going to come in fast. And it's only going to be about 15, maybe 20 miles an hour faster, which is only about 10 knots. And we'll see what happens then. Welcome back, guys. This is attempt two. We're at 100 uh, miles an hour. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to about 90. I'm still going to deploy full flat to try and help us with our uh, rate of descent and braking. I'm trying to maintain the... Uh, the position of the aim point in our windshield. If anything, we're going a little bit slower than I wanted to do for this demonstration. However, we are high, so uh, we'll control our speed with the nose. We wanted 90 knots, let's see how we get on. Let's actually bother to get ourselves straight on the centre line. Now this is where you're going to see the effects of, um, of ground speed, and uh, as a result of the ground speed, you'll see the effects of our float. So as I said, we'd be between 90 and 100. We're coming back into a more uh, normal profile, if that makes sense. So now we've got a flatter profile. This is why you tend to fly a slightly steeper approach in a light aircraft, is because of the trees short of the threshold look. You know, this is a three degree approach, but look at where the trees are. So now we're at uh, 95 miles an hour. We're only 20 miles an hour, an hour above the recommended speed of uh, maximum speed of 75 miles an hour as a landing speed. Oh, the numbers are going underneath us, so let's close the throttle, let's panic. But we're still going too fast. The ground cushioning means the aircraft doesn't want to go down. We're still losing speed, but the ground cushion, the aircraft doesn't want to go down. Heavy landing towards the end. We've bounced the nose wheel, we're hard on the brakes, the throttle is fully closed. And here we go, we're still doing 40 miles an hour. This is the end of the runway. And are we going to stop? No. Imagine that with a hedge line or ditch in the end. Um, you know, we would have nosed over. Now, on recognising that, that's where you do a go around. But you've just seen the effect of the ground effect. And the effect of the ground effect is that even with full flap, which can be quite draggy, even with full flap, we've landed long because the aircraft did not want to go down. That's a combination of the speed and the ground effect. And even though as we came over the threshold we had the throttle fully closed and full flap it did not want to go down now that's only about 15 maybe 20 miles an hour difference which let's you know 75 miles an hour to 90 miles an hour doesn't seem like that much of a difference but you can now visually see the difference and why the speed is important uh, the speed is your fundamental control the key thing that you need to look at in an aircraft doing a landing Control this and the rest of the landing will be a nice stable approach. So hopefully you guys found that useful. If you did, please don't forget to tick like, subscribe or share. Um, and if you have any questions or any remarks, please feel free to leave them in the comments below and I shall speak to you guys soon. Take care.